Welcome back to our Dan Education series on the heart, health and diving. We're in chapter 6 of 7 chapters and in this chapter we'll be discussing pulmonary and venous disorders including deep venous thrombosis, pulmonary embolism and immersion pulmonary edema. Keep watching. Pulmonary and venous disorders include the risk of deep venous thrombosis, which is a condition that may occur particularly in flights that last for more than four hours. Many people fly to diving destinations and therefore deep venous thrombosis is more common than one might think. Now our lungs have many functions in the body beyond just oxygenating blood and one of them is actually filtering out venous blood clots and it can handle a certain number of them just as it can handle a certain number of decompression related bubbles. The problem is that if a clot is of significant size because it has come from a large vein typically one that is above the knee it may be not only transported to the lungs but it may block the blood vessels of the lungs to such an extent that it can completely obscure in other words prevent circulation in the lungs. Now deep venous thrombosis again is when a blood clot forms in the veins usually the legs and then breaks free and travels through the circulatory system. If it lodges in the lungs and blocks the circulation it can be life-threatening. Collectively DVT or deep venous thrombosis and PE or pulmonary embolism are sometimes referred to in combination as venous thromboembolism or VTEs. A clot that originates as a deep venous thrombosis can also cause a stroke in individuals who have a patent foramen ovale that allows the clot to cross the heart between the atria. And we've discussed those shunts in previous sections. The clot may travel through the veins of the right atrium and pass through the PFO into the arteries and from there to the brain. DVT is not specifically related to diving but divers often travel and travel and flights as we said are four hours and longer are a significant risk factor for deep venous thrombosis. About half the cases of DVT are not noticeable however and do not necessarily result in swelling of the legs which is one of the classic signs or pain in the calf. Now on the other hand sometimes there may be swelling of the affected leg, ankle or foot or pain in the calf that spreads to the ankle or foot. Additional warmth in the affected area or change in color of the skin either to pale, red or blue. Most VTEs related to air travel occur within two weeks of the flight and are typically resolved within eight weeks. If untreated a DVT that starts in the calf may spread into the thigh and pelvis in about 25 percent of cases. An untreated DVT of the thigh and pelvis results in about a 50 percent risk of pulmonary embolism and a serious pulmonary embolism at that. Many cases of DVT are asymptomatic and resolve spontaneously. However, if DVT often recurs in an individual who has had one episode, one should look for pre-existing risk factors such as remaining motionless for long periods of time or specific risk factors that increase the chances 
of not only venous stasis, but also clotting. That's one of the reasons why in the airlines people are encouraged to massage their calves or move around, as that reduces the chance of forming a clot. For every additional hour you spend sitting, the risk of forming a clot increases by 10%. Now the incidence of DVT in the general population is one-tenth of one percent, so it's quite low. But it's high in those who have risk factors, including those who travel long distances, in which the risk may double or even quadruple. It's also sometimes called economy class syndrome, which is an unfair term. And the reason for that being that individuals flying in economy class can sometimes sit in cramped positions for prolonged periods of time. If the symptoms in the ankle, in the foot, or swelling of the leg in general, discoloration is noted, these should be considered as possible signs of deep venous thrombosis. Other risk factors include older age, which is being older than the age of 40, obesity, which is defined as a body mass index greater than 30, estrogen use, either through hormonal contraceptives or hormone replacement therapy, pregnancy, including the period after giving birth for about six weeks, thrombophilia, which is an abnormal tendency to form clots, and a history, family history, of deep venous thrombosis. It can also include active cancer and other serious medical illnesses. Recent surgery and hospitalization or trauma and limited mobility are additional considerations. Central venous catheterization, which is a catheter being placed into the chest, may sometimes be used to remove a deep venous thrombosis that has resulted in pulmonary embolism. But it's a procedure that may not readily be available and certainly not in a remote dive site. Height is also a risk factor for one's chance of developing deep venous thrombosis. People who are either very short, less than 1.6 meters, or very tall, greater than 1.9 meters, appear to be at increased risk as a result of the decreased ability to adjust their seat sufficiently when flying to their height and the additional immobility of the shorter passengers which may therefore lead to them having a greater chance of deep venous thrombosis as a result of sitting relatively still. All of these factors may contribute to deep venous thrombosis and activating the blood clotting systems. Those with an increased risk of deep venous thrombosis should wear compression stockings whenever they fly or drive long distances and should consult their primary care provider about taking clot preventative medications such as aspirin and in certain cases warfarin. Individuals need a proper workup including a visit to a specialist physician, cardiologist and certainly a diving medical practitioner. So what about the effects on diving? Any individual who has been diagnosed with acute deep venous thrombosis or is taking anticoagulants should refrain from diving until it has properly been worked out. It may be possible to return to diving after a period of time once fitness has been established. But this is made on an individual basis, depending on medication that is necessary and of course whether or not the clot has actually resolved. Thank you for watching this episode. Uh, remember to keep watching the future episodes uh, of which the next one will discuss other aspects of venous and pulmonary problems. Thanks for watching.